Right, so welcome to my Big Data in Trenches talk. Um, very glad you made it today after yesterday's party. Um, let's start with a small definition that you can find everywhere. Well, big data is a bit used, uh, abused term nowadays, but Wikipedia says it's sets of data that's too large for the traditional tools um, to process, basically, and are they're a bit inadequate. So, okay, I'll use this. So, what uh, what I'll be talking to, uh, today? I'll try to <coughs> follow some uh, some ag agenda. I'll try to talk about uh, our experiences with, with big data and uh, huge traffic. So we'll start with producing, where data is born, and how do we capture it, and how usually people do that. Uh, then I move to processing, um, which is online asynchronous streaming and batch processing, which is nothing new. And some lesson learned and our insights from how to do that properly or not. I'm Wojtek Schnapka, I'm head of development at Excalibur, the part of Cherry Group. Um, I'm a big PHP fan, as well as Python and Spark. I'm in the business for 10 years. So let's get started. Right, so we'll start with data production. Um, big data needs to burn born somewhere. Uh, so I usually refer to the data production in to category it's in, uh, into two categories basically. It's either active or passive. Um, uh, as a fact, I was I was trying to find out how much data is get generated nowadays, but it's a bit hard. But for instance, Google pass process more than three billion requests per day, and it's like ten exabytes, so it's just crazy. And Facebook alone produces two and a half billion pieces of content. Two and, uh, two and seven place uh, lights and 300 million photos. So those are un insane numbers that you need to first capture and then process. Okay, let's uh, focus on active data generation because this is what, I'm, what I'll be referring most of the time today. Um, so you can, uh, you can have different sources of your... Basically, usually it's your application. It's either you know search engine, uh, gaming platform, social media, um, activity tracker, whatsoever. Um, could be uh, sensors from Internet of Things hype nowadays, or could be uh, user content that your user produce. Well, usually user produce everything, but uh, in this particular case, it's, it's user content, so-called. And if you think about passive media uh, uh, data generation, it's usually logs and stuff, something which is byproduct of, of your application uh, production. So logs are also very valuable if you do a <coughs> bigger, uh, bigger uh, application, then you probably have tens and thousands of logs, uh, which properly processed gives you a lot of insights as well. Um, so what I'll be talking about, uh, what we do uh, at Excalibur and at Cherry, um, we, we develop a PHP application for affiliates, which is quite similar to Google AdWords, Google AdSense, where you put banners and uh, advertisements on your visitors, on your partners' websites. And we are uh, developing event tracking, something similar to Google, um, Google Analytics, but uh, has some other considerations. And it's used in iGaming industry, so casinos, sportsbook, and stuff like this. Okay, so if you think about really high throughput application, something that needs to run very fast and need to handle a lot of data, then you can uh, then you probably need to consider a few things that are listed here. So first of all, your application needs to be as light as possible. Really, you need to drop everything that is not necessarily needed. Um, Zend or Symfony or whatever you use, even Silex, uh, it's not suitable for, for high load and it gives you additional uh, overhead that you don't want to have, basically. Then um, you need to strip down all your libraries because they are giving you overhead as well. Even if you remove uh, Zend, for instance, but you still, or Symfony, but you still use um, dependency injection container. Uh, it will uh, it will have uh, major impact on performance, and you probably need to think about some NoSQL database to store it uh, quickly. I'll get back to it later. 
Okay, so here's a simple tracking uh, example. Uh, this is version before being uh, stripped down from Zen framework, basically. So what it does, it basically uh, has some tracking service where the business logic is stored, and you find uh, the media that you want to display or, or track, and you either store the click or you store an impression, and you redirect to the, to the landing page. This is so simple, you, you don't need to any framework for that. Um, so basically what we did in the first phase is we removed all modules. This, is, this was Zend framework, uh, basically application. So we removed all Zend modules uh, based on some ugly if. Um, but then uh, it's still not, not uh, the, best, the best performance. So we remove the framework entirely and just have a plain PHP file with some services initialization in the top and then this logic. And when we did that, we gain three times better performance by dropping uh, Zen framework. And this is, this is already optimized by removing those not needed modules in that case. This gave us 10 times better than with standards and framework. So this is something that you should should keep in mind. Um, if we think about the real quick gathering data, you need to be prepared for fast writes. It's very easy, and you probably heard tens and thousands of uh, talks regarding caching, but this is quite easy to cache static contents or contents that are uh, in some way could be cached for some time uh, period. Unfortunately, in tracking example on or in any kind of transactional like gaming platform, you cannot cache that things uh, because this is rights. You need to be prepared for rights. And in that case, you need to really care about horizontal scalability. So uh, you need to have stateless application and uh, basically have some engine that will allow you to do that quickly. What's, uh, what else is uh, interesting is that failover and replicas. It's kind of catchy word when you look for like Couchbase, Mongo, React, any other NoSQL storage, but it's really useful. Um, notes on production fails from time to time in the most inappropriate times of day. So if you have proper replica and a failover setup, then you will sleep a bit better. Okay, so we have two systems that I was uh, telling you about. The one you saw the, the code and the other is uh, event tracking. I'll t tell you a bit more. And if you choose uh, the NoSQL storage, you probably need to uh, keep in mind CAP theorem. And th the definition is written there. You probably heard it at some point of time. Uh, so basically, mm, when you're choosing the, the storage, you, you choose between strong consistency and, and a visual consistency. What that means? Um, the strong consistency is that you always are assured that whatever you write, you will read that in subsequent uh, in subsequent uh, call, or you will you get always the same uh, state of, of data, which is very important when you have kind of transactions or subsequent reads or subsequent operations. Let's say we have event tracking, which tracks um, and tracks user activity on on your on your page on your casino, for instance and someone new comes in and you save, uh, save for him the event, the event object, which is, okay, this is very important, but if, it's, if you lose it at some point of time, it's not a big deal, but it saves also visitor. And you ref refer to that visitor in the next read, or uh, you refer to that in, for instance, uh, half second later in uh, background task. If it's is lost some at some point of time, then you have problems. So then you need strong consistency and no SQL storage, like for instance Couchbase. For uh, for the storages that n doesn't necessarily require uh, the strong consistency, you can think about something like AP, which is for instance uh, RIAC, which is very cool as well, has a lot of nice features. Uh, so this is something that is uh, that could be could be overlooked uh, in the development and architecture phase, but this is really important. Okay, um, so that was uh, that was data generation. Let's move to data processing. Um, 
you heard great presentation from Mariusz Gil yesterday about graph processing and how people don't uh, underestimate graph uh, graphs and, and processing overall. So data processing is very very um, big thing in those kind of uh, jobs. So first of all, you have online processing. So you process the things that coming to your application in that given time. And uh, for that, you should only process what absolutely required. Um, so for instance, um, you have this event tracking application that could replay to your um, event in different manners. So if you need to replay something to the browser immediately, just JavaScript to be uh, executed, then you probably need to do that online and process it online. If you have something that is not really required to be synchronous and blocking, you can uh, process it uh, in the background in queue, and I'll talk about it in, in a bit. Okay, so what kind of strategies you, coul you could have for uh, online processing? It's basically, um, there are of course many more, but uh, materialized view are one of them, which works really well. So you do uh, you do pack your data in kind of view and you put it to NoSQL storage and fetch it via key. So whenever something happens on your application, you fetch that view and you have everything in memory straight away. This is very uh, um, this is very fast, but also it's kind of prone error prone because it's it's basically cache. Um, then you could uh, do range of keys which we did in the past and uh, which is also good. Couch Couchbase allows you to do that and you can have like the keys range in one bucket and then the rest uh, in the, in the different documents uh, under different keys. Um, this is good. Only thing you need to consider is that you're doing range of um, gets from, from your storage. But for some, for some circumstances, this is, uh, this is absolutely fine. And um, the most flexible way is to doing some map reduce or uh, fetch data from kind of um, uh, kind of find like Mongo find thing. Um, this is also very useful, but you need to f keep in mind that it's usually either slower or not so consistent. Especially when you think about Kajubase and map reduce views, those are eventually consistent. So if you insert document and that document will occur in MapReduce views after a while, after it it's uh, being indexed, but uh, this gives you some, some performance as well. Um, if you don't need, uh, like for instance, you have action of sending a webhook, uh, sending API call, you probably don't want to do that online while your visitor is uh, using the application, you you most likely you would move it to the to the background the, to the asynchronous task. For that, um, you need a queue broker. We picked RabbitMQ, but most likely next pick will be will be Kafka. Um, RabbitMQ is is very cool, <coughs> um, but for loads like really huge loads like and they have in LinkedIn where they build Kafka. It Kafka could handle one million of requests per second. So this is, this is totally insane. Um, so so for, for those kind of asynchronous tasks, you need queue. You could do that in different ways, but let's not mention it because we are all grown ups and no one does like flags processed or not in data, but no. So you do, uh, this is suitable for heavy, for heavy tasks and time consuming things. And not only something that will uh, interrupt your uh, user experience, but something that's really uh, huge, like report generation or materialized views uh, update in the background. It also requires very careful um, error handling because if you, if something fails and it fails, usually big time, uh, mostly due to memory leaks or something like this, because those are wrong landing tasks. They are running for like weeks or so, uh, processing and listening to the queue. Uh, so you need to be aware that something fails needs to be restarted. And uh, that's why you probably want to s have some kind of process management in, a, in place, like supervisors or so, which will take care of restarts and, and crashes, basically. So it will keep your, 
keep your jobs um, alive. Uh, what's very important here and what uh, all uh, suggest is uh, to having asynchronous processing from the day one because if you have queue and you put everything into the queue, uh, then you have possibility to extend it later. Then you can fetch data from that queue in streaming job, which I'll be talking in next slide, or no, next slide after. Uh, so what we also do, and it's wo what's also um, a good practice, in my opinion, is uh, data aggregation. So instead of fetching your data from uh, from NoSQL storage for kind of reporting, you could do that. Of course, uh, it's a bit time-consuming, and you're you're killing your production cluster, unless you have second cluster for uh, for analytics and you replicate data to that. Um, but what what we do is uh, we aggregate this to a MySQL database for the for back office application for the reporting stuff. And so we run every uh, like five minutes aggregation of, of events that occurred, we group them and store uh, somewhere. This is not optimal way, I will tell you a bit uh, in next slides. So our story with aggregation, uh, because we used Couchbase, uh, which is quite okay. Um, it's nice to have a lot of uh, a lot of possibilities and a lot of features, quite nice features, but it also have Nickel engine. Um, for uh, still version three, it was a kind of separate thing, which you install a site of Couchbase cluster. It connects to Couchbase and d does a SQL engine for you. Um, now in version four, it's uh, it's bundled uh, and it comes together with Couchbase. You don't need to do anything more. But for larger volumes of data, it basically doesn't work. It indexes forever, and uh, I cannot imagine machines for that to to work properly. Uh, so, um, but it's cool, cool feature. You could have uh, uh, you could have really SQL language for your. Uh, no SQL data, and this is uh, very useful for in some some places, but uh, not for for data aggregation. No. So what we did, we moved to uh, MapReduce task, so called views. Uh, views are really cool in Couchbase because they can can have composite keys, uh, so you could uh, you could yield some data, you can emit some data, and emit key, and then uh, reduce will group it, but the key will be array. So that array uh, could be filtered. You could say you'll probably uh, have array uh, of four elements, like some kind of identifier, let's say host, and uh, date split it by month, day, and year. So uh, given that, you could easily filter that, and you can easily shrink your result sets to what you really need. So it works fine, but it requires a lot of RAM because everything needs to be uh, indexed. The best way forward uh, in my books is uh, Spark streaming or streaming uh, in general. So you have everything in queue uh, or in uh, in Kafka, for instance, or in Rabbit, and it fetches that from from that in Spark streaming. Uh, you do uh, aggregation there and se and send it to to MySQL, for instance. What's good there? You don't need to uh, fetch entire day. You just fetch what's coming in in the batch interval. All right. So stream processing is a new kit in a block nowadays. It's very cool and very promising uh, approach. It gives uh, way way better performance and way more uh, way more possibilities. Uh, so basically, what it it allows you, it runs MapReduce uh, on top of uh, your stream. It uh, chunks it into the the chunks of data in, in batches, and for for an uh, interval. Um, Spark provides a lot more possibilities. In you can have uh, timed uh, windows, uh, so you can operate over windows of times across the intervals. You could have. Um, you could mix it with with other things, uh, with other Spark li libraries. You could have state operations, so you could refer to the state that you had previously, which is also very cool. So, 
uh, how it how it works. Uh, oh, sorry. Mm, usually in streaming uh, world, you have source and sync, and something in the middle which is fetching from the source and outputting into the to the sync. Um, the uh, the source could be uh, could be basically anything. Uh, most likely it will, will be Kafka because Kafka is natively supported by by Spark. Um, you could uh, run uh, your Spark with Scala, Python, and uh, Java. Uh, so Python, unfortunately, doesn't have custom things, uh, custom sources. Sorry, and you you will have some hard time. Uh, Attaching RabbitMQ to that. I, if you uh, do that in Scala, it's it's cool and it's out of the box basically, just just a one plugin. But uh, so that's why Kafka is is first on the citizen here because it's uh, it's basically everywhere and it's very easy to use. Uh, you could have files resource like file fi uh, files directory and it will fetch new files and process them. It uh, could be TCP socket as well for some uh, proof of concepts or uh, memory buffers, uh, which we used uh, with Apache Flume and and uh, custom Spark Sync. Mm. So uh, Spark uh, is, uh, I would say, is one of the most extensively adopted uh, tool in the market in case of big data. Uh, just just uh, after Hadoop, but this is kind of in my opinion, is Hadoop is going down and Spark is going up. Um, but the power of Spark is that you could have multiple uh, jobs in one place. So besides Spark streaming, you have machine learning, uh, you could have SQL, Spark SQL, and even graph uh, processing. So Mario should be very pleased. Right, and th the last thing uh, regarding data processing is is batch processing, the the thing old as as call. Uh, why you do that batch processing? Because usually you need uh, kind of analytics and reporting. You could uh, update your machine learning models and stuff like this with batch processing. How you do that? Often, uh, most people do that in Hadoop, and Hadoop is absolutely fine. But I would say Spark is even better. Spark does a lot of things in memory, so yeah, if you have a lot of memory, then then you're fine. Uh, but it runs really fast and then caches a lot of things and and this does uh, crazy things with tungsten engine and stuff like this. And uh, what you do and um, what do you process is basically uh, something that it's already waiting for you. Um, so our story with batch processing is okay. Uh, is um, okay. Couchbase is nice, but if you are starting to having like more than hundred millions of documents, your bucket will start to filling up, and you will just run basically out of space. This is cool if you have a lot of money to throw at it, but uh, if you want to spare some bucks, then you uh, backup it, gzip, and send to. Uh, to S3, for for instance, or to HDFS, whatever it works for you, and then you do batch processing uh, over it uh, if you need. If you don't need, you just keep it there. S3 is extremely cheap. Um, you could have like enormous cluster with enormous space and and uh, RAM, uh, but then uh, we're talking about web scale, and this is this is not uh, not efficient way to to spend money basically. Right, and the last thing regarding SQL uh, is that SQL is not dead, as uh, many would say, uh, because of MapReduce, Hadoop, Spark, and stuff like this. Um, nope, most of Hadoop uh, tools and big data tools implement SQL to operate over your data. Uh, Spark does it very, very uh, clever. It's, uh, it's um, performance is really, really amazing. Um, and it's SQL is okay. Let's be honest. It's very convenient to to fetch your data using SQL rather than MapReduce and stuff like this. Uh, you have uh, multiple SQL uh, implementation on on the market. Uh, in that right uh, pane, you can see it. Um, 
Spark SQL is really cool thing and it's really easy to, to start, uh, but uh, Hive is something that is in the market for a long, long time. And Hive, uh, Spark is compatible with Hive as well. Uh, so what give what are pros uh, of using Spark uh, SQL is that you can seamlessly can mix your Spark code with machine learning with graphs. You can use Spark SQL in uh, stream processing basically everywhere, and it gives uh, gives quite a nice uh, pipeline of, of jobs. It has variety of sources. Um, Arvo Hive. Parquet, which is very cool for, for big uh, big sets, and JSON, of course. And you can connect it to JDBC or ODBC for, uh, f for fur further analysis with tools like Tableau or stuff like this. Right, I will show you a bit of uh, SQL code here and SQL approach uh, in Spark. Uh, I'll be showing the example running on Databricks. Databricks is a company standing behind the Spark and they are contributing uh, big time there. And they have a lot of uh, funding and a lot of cash involved, so Spark is uh, really picking up uh, the, the pace. Uh, so what we do here is we register the demand point whenever our data lies. In this case, it's uh, AWS S3. So we use um, Databricks uh, DB Utils. It's not Spark uh, by default, but it's in, in Databricks Cloud. What you do next is a uh, uh, small Python code that reads and transform data, it filters, cleans, uh, whatever is required. And then you run SQL query with uh, person SQL shorthand, which is very convenient. Hope it's readable. Uh, so in the, in the top, you have dbutils uh, fs font. This is a month. This is uh, basically your access key and, and uh, secret key, your bucket, uh, basically the place where data is. Then you have some um, some function to process that data because it's not very JSON, it's a bit of compilations of JSON, so we need to do some, some stuff over it. You load that file, you filter it, uh, you, you map your function that is uh, on top, and then you register table. Um, and that's it. Once you do that, you could uh, output it to Parquet, for instance, for faster, or you could cache it, and then you could run any SQL uh, command that you, you can imagine. So this is, this is that simple, few lines of code, and you run SQL on of over terabytes of JSON files, not even SQL uh, tables. Okay, I think I'm running out of time. So what we've learned during that uh, adventure, so basically you need to think stateless about your systems, because if it's stateless, then it's easily to scale horizontally. You could easily add new web nodes uh, into the cluster, as well as adding new Couchbase or Mongo or Ryak uh, storage clusters, basically. You really need to forget about frameworks and, and other libraries that are not necessarily needed. Uh, the, the previous example showed that maybe you don't need monolog in your tracking endpoint because it's very thin. Maybe this error lock is good enough, uh, or syslog, or whatever else. Um, life learned that um, you should segregate your uh, servers, your responsibilities. So if you have servers that run uh, PHP FPM, um, they should run only PHP FPM. Uh, of course, databases are on in the separate cluster, and uh, CLI tasks, cron jobs, should be de delegated to other um, to other server. Uh, otherwise, you'll you'll have lots of pains uh, during uh, during the peak times. Um, data in horizontal scalable storage. That's because uh, you, if you could predict your your traffic, th then it's okay. But usually there are peaks, there are things that marketing doesn't tell you that they are running big campaign, and you're running out of the, the RAM, basically because indexing is, is uh, picking up really quickly. So then you add the note, or you, have, you could have uh, auto-scaling as well. Um, usually it's a good idea to aggregate data for, for immediate access. Uh, so you either do MapReduce uh, 
in some interval or you have streaming which is even better and the online storage is very expensive all those nice uh, NoSQL tools like Couchbase, Mongo, React that requires a lot of resources a lot of RAM and uh, Spark as well so it's usually a good idea to uh, to keep it just for f keep it what uh, really is needed and uh, move rest to cold storage like S3 or HDFS. HDFS could be probably a better uh, idea. Of course, um, offloading to the background is very important. I think that's, that's quite obvious. Um, if you like to run uh, Spark jobs or to play around, uh, I strongly encourage to use notebooks like Databricks, uh, so you have everything in browser and you run your, your data, the, uh, you can share your notebooks or results of notebook. notebook. Um, if you run it on premises, probably Spark uh, Notebook IO or Apache Zeppelin would be a good choice. If you consider cloud, Databricks would be nice for interactive uh, data analysis. That's pretty much it. If you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. I don't know if we have time for that. Thank you.